welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Some of you here for the first time, as Jeff acknowledged earlier on. Some of you here probably for the last time. Well, we love you and forgive you. <laughs> but, uh, but we're glad you're all here. We're trusting the Lord for a, a great couple of days together. Uh, Jeff had mentioned earlier some of our uh, Biblical Family Ministries things out there on display. Just quickly, I'll say the books are available on a donation basis. Uh, we suggest a $10 donation. You say, I can't give $10 and give whatever you can give. And you say, I can't give anything. You want the book? Take the book. Nobody's going to be chasing you down. We want those things to get out. So uh, we'd be glad for that. This little book with the promised one, there's a bunch of them out there. I wrote this for evangelistic purposes. It's a lot longer than a track because, as Pastor Motes gave clear truth, our country doesn't know much about the Lord anymore because of what's happened in the public school. So this is evangelistic. I'd love you to take one, take two, take it and hand it out to somebody who needs to be saved. If you like it, you say, yeah, I like that. You let us know. We'll send you as many as you want at no charge because we want to get God's word out. So that uh, Christianity Pure and Simple, a little card that my wife and I often use at a restaurant or I put in with a bill. It talks about uh, the challenge of, of Christianity and then it takes folks to a website and they see a video presentation of the gospel. So again, you pick that up, you think, yeah, I'd like that, let us know, we'll send you as many as you want. And then a couple of years ago, we started uh, uh, by the book, a little podcast. We put up a new message every Friday. We'd love you to pick up this card and get on and to listen and encourage others to listen as well. So that's all I'm saying for right now, but I'll say more. I'm glad that we have evangelist Ken Lynch with us to, uh, to speak to us today. He's going to minister uh, on those glasses soon. But I want to tell you about when I think of him. I think of an event about 1972 or 3. It's a long way back. We had started the Christian school in Westchester and Brother Lynch at that time attended Bible Covenant Baptist Church down the media area, and we kind of labored together because we needed the building space. So we would have kids go down there and hold the uh, upper classes there and the younger classes in our facility and so on. But then we had a Christmas banquet, and somehow he and I, along with Pastor Bob Walter and somebody else, got hooked into a pantomime of Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> and that's what I think of when I think of him. <laughs> However, thankfully, neither he nor I were Alvin. So I'm grateful for that Amen. because Pastor Bob did the part of Alvin and he was amazing. So that's my memory of whatever 50 years ago or whatever it is. <laughs> But we've known each other a long time, and I appreciate him. We were out to dinner last night and talked, and, and one of the things we talked about, and I shared my appreciation of him, is that over these years, he hasn't changed. And by God's grace, I hope I haven't changed either, because that's the tragedy of our day. Uh, churches and schools and individuals changing, and uh, we ought not. We cannot. So I appreciate him. I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to play those glasses for us, and then we're going to ask him to preach the word to us. Thank you, Thank you, brother. God bless you. I remember when your three children, four children, were riding the school bus. Jennifer would get on the bus, and every morning she'd give me a hug. And she gave me a hug today. Amen. Well, I'm delighted to be able to be here. I, uh, Pastor asked me last night, did you bring any music? I said, no, I wasn't planning to do any. Nobody said anything, and I don't want to presume, so my violins and all those things are back in the motorhome in Pittsburgh. I have to leave tomorrow morning to go back to Pittsburgh to start meetings on Sunday morning. Um, and then my wife said, oh, but your glasses are in the car. I thought they were on my face. <laughs> so, I said, yeah, we could do that. So we got the glasses out. This is not the set. If you're familiar with my ministry, this is a new set. My other set actually died, believe it or not. And we had to retire them, and the Lord provided these. And these are handmade, hand blown in Poland. And so it was quite expensive and expensive for them to be imported with duty because the government wants its cut. Can we have the lights turned out, please? I didn't warn you.
make it reverse it. I like that. <laughs> this is my first conference like this, and I'm delighted to be able to be here. Um, I do have a few brochures for you pastors if you'd like to take one along and also some prayer cards. Uh, many of you, if you know anything about me, know I lost my wife this coming January will be six years. And uh, my wife told me many times, if I go first, here's who I want you to marry. And she picked my second wife for me. The problem is that young lady passed away four months after Barb did. <laughs> so my girls said, okay, Dad, now it's up to us. <laughs> you know, sometimes children don't want their surviving spouse to remarry, the surviving parent to marry, but my girls believed that it was uh, important for the Lord God said that man should not live alone and all that sort of thing. When Barb passed away, I, she died in her sleep, totally unexpected, a shock to all of us. And I found her that morning, I said, Lord, you took her and left me. It's like you said, be patient, buddy. You're on the later bus. Her work is done. She can come home. Yours isn't, so get busy. So by God's grace, that's what I've uh, tried to do. And, and uh, I dated a couple of ladies, took them out to dinner. And, and one lady, she made it very clear. She said, you know, I, uh, I'm concerned about the age difference. You're nine years older than me. And then she said, I don't want to be away from home as much as you are. And I'm thinking again, don't marry an evangelist. <coughs> and then the real deal, deal breaker was she said, you know, I'm a retired nurse. I'm used to being in charge and telling everybody else what to do. <laughs> Good, good to know that before we get involved. <laughs> and then a pastor for whom I have great respect recommended very strongly that I try eHarmony because that's where he found his second wife. And let me tell you, gentlemen, it was a total, total disaster. <laughs> In my profile, I wrote, I'm an independent, fundamental Baptist evangelist. Shouldn't that have narrowed it down some? <laughs> I said, no, no drinking, no divorce, and no rock music. Shouldn't that have narrowed it down some? They sent me, they must have sent me, I'm not exaggerating, 150 possible contacts. They twice, eHarmony, contacted me, said, you know, if you'd loosen up a little bit, I said, whoa, 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 you don't know me. And one lady wrote, said, oh, you must be just a perfect man, very sarcastic, all these no's and all these no's. And I wrote back, I remembered very distinctly, I said, ma'am, I'm far from perfect. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Amen. But I am in the ministry, and I do have specific needs. And I contacted you, Harmony, said, I'm out of here. No more contacts. Don't put my name. Well, you can't get a refund. I don't care about the refund. Just close it out. And I said, Lord, I'm done looking. If you have somebody for me, you bring her to me. Uh, so you brought Eve to Adam. He didn't go looking. He didn't ask. And so I just left it with the Lord. About six months later, the ladies really want to hear this, not you guys. But she just, anyway. <laughs> she always asks, how did you meet? Well, my first meeting in the church with John DeMender was 45, 43 years ago in 1980. And I have had meetings on a regular basis there ever since. And she's been there about 15 years. So we've known who each other is so all these years. And uh, but they, the only church in that area that I know of still has a watch night service on New Year's Eve. And I grew up on those, so I would go with my single daughter. We'd go every New Year's Eve. And uh, year, two years ago, this coming New Year's Eve, I was one of the speakers, and, and I had the first meeting, and then we had a fellowship time, and then Mike Maynard was the second speaker. And, and I sat down, I got my food, was sitting down at the table, and nobody else was at the table. My daughter was about ready to get, get down the line. And, and Joan came over and sat across the table from me and started talking. She said, you know, you're one of the speakers. You shouldn't be sitting here alone. And we started talking. Little did I know that there was another couple over there watching us, and they right there had us married. <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing I remember was talking about how, how you know, how we, uh, the death of our spouses and how we handled it and all that sort of thing. And, and I felt very comfortable with her. So I said, oh, boy, I have to check this out. So I did a background check on her. <laughs> <laughs> I called her pastor. And I found out she used to drive a school bus. So did I. She has an active motorcycle license, <laughs> which I don't have. <laughs> she used to drive a big truck, not an 18-wheeler, but a big one. And she, liked, she uh, likes to fish, and she loves to travel. I thought, wow, that's a match made in heaven. 
The only negative thing I found out about her was that she likes football. <laughs> I don't like football. I said, well, as long as she's not a Steelers fan, I guess that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to tell this story next, this Sunday, next Sunday morning in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we, we started talking on the phone. She, she did her background check with me about me with her pastor. And anyway, uh, we were talking with my grandson called and said, Grandpa, are you dating? I said, no, not really. What do you mean? I said, well, she's back east. I'm on the road. Well, don't you ever call her on the phone? I said, yeah, well, how often? Every day. Well, how long do you talk? Oh, about an hour. Grandpa, welcome to the 21st century. You're dating. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, it came down to this fellow right here pushed me over the edge. Dr. G. Pastor G. G. Something about that. And he said, just do it. So on a Monday night, I called on the phone. I said, Joan, do you have a Bible handy? She said, yeah. I said, uh, would you get it, please? She said, where do you want me to turn to? I said, I want you to turn to page 735, the right-hand column, the sixth verse from the top, because that was the Bible that I had. And uh, she said, well, where's that going to take me? I said, <clears throat> Psalm 34.3. So I waited for her to turn there. I read it to her. And it says this, so magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So I said, let me... Read that again as a question. Joan, will you magnify the Lord with me so we can exalt his name together? How could she argue with scripture? <laughs> <laughs> and so her pastor announced our engagement, said this is the worst kept secret in our church's history. And I said, yes, and your people are going to host a lynching party on February 25th. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. I am now in my 46th year of, tra year of traveling ministry. It's hard to believe. We were talking last night about how long it's been. Boy, the years go by so quickly. And uh, God has been very, very good to me. I'm, my health is good, and I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in the future. I want to go a couple places with you today, if you will, please. Let's begin at turning to Matthew chapter 9. The crisis of evangelism. Here it is. We don't know it. We don't do it. And we'll talk about that as we go through. And when I get later on in the message, uh, we have a couple of young men ready to hand out, pass out some handouts. I have a handout for you that I hope will be helpful to you. Um, the first thing I want to note here, I have four simple points to our study this morning. Number one, if we're going to have an evangelistic church or an evangelistic life, we need to, number one, have an evangelistic passion. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now notice verse 36. <clears throat> but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. On this particular instance, the Lord Jesus did not minister to those people, but he was about to minister to his disciples, emphasizing the need for evangelism. The harvest truly is plenteous, the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We need to develop then a, an evangelistic passion and desire to seek folks in. Now if you'll go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verses 1 to 3. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, for my kinsmen, according to the flesh, or Israelites to whom pretendeth the adoption. Paul is actually saying here, if it were possible... I wish that I could be lost if by my being lost and going to hell, it might be the salvation of my fellow countrymen, my Jewish, my, my Jewish brethren. Folks, that's a hard thing to say. Can you honestly say, and, and I, I, I struggle with this some myself, can I honestly say, can any of us honestly say, I wish that I could be accursed if it means my unsaved so-and-so family member is going to be saved. That's the kind of a burden and a passion the Apostle Paul had for the Jewish people. Over in chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record 
They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Over in Acts chapter 20, when Paul visits with the Ephesian elders from Miletus, and they come to him, he says, You know, gentlemen, from the first day, that for three years I ceased not to warn everyone, night and day, with tears, in order to try to teach you the truth and expose you to the gospel, that you might ultimately be saved. And of course, we know that a great church was established there in Ephesus, and many believe that Timothy may have been the pastor there. Uh, in Psalm 120, 126, David so in tears, shall reap until he that goeth forth with reaping, with weeping rather, bearing the precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And let me tell you this, gentlemen, where there is no weeping, there will be no reaping. We have lost our passion for souls. So we need to develop, number one, a passion, uh, an evangelistic passion in our own hearts, looking for opportunities to share the gospel. If all it means is, is to give a gospel track, I have one that I wrote. I don't have one here. It's, I have one. Yeah, it's in my pocket. I only have two left. I have a whole bunch of them on the left. I've given them all that. I have the picture of the USS Francis Mary at APA 249. And I, I, I served on that ship when I was in the Navy. And so I wrote a little tract about it. And I give it up. So this is the ship I served on when I was in the Navy. And people readily receive it. They, they smile. Well, thank you for your service. Boy, that's cool. I'm going to read that. Happened last night, didn't it? And, and again this morning. Uh, looking for opportunities where we recognize the need that people have without Christ. Um, I don't know how to, how to express this exactly, but we look at people and what do we see? Jesus saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. Do you like to watch people? Uh, I was disturbed by what our brother said this morning about the Macy Day Parade. I'm done with Macy's. I don't shop there, but I will never shop there. I don't, I, don't, I, don't go to, I don't go to the coffee place either, go to Starbucks or something like that. I don't drink coffee. I'm saved and sanctified. I don't need that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they, their, their, their officials have gone on with the gay stuff, and so if you want to go public with that, I'll just be just as public against it. So uh, my choice, I don't have to buy your product. You don't want my business? I'll be happy not to give it to you. I didn't do it anyway, but now I have a reason for that choice. <laughs> Go to Philadelphia sometime, downtown Philadelphia, and just park yourself on a, I just don't have benches there in the corners anymore, <laughs> but just park yourself on a corner and just watch the people go by. But when you do, look at their faces, and you will see an emptiness. You look in their eyes, and they, they might have a, a Hollywood smile. These people who can, I don't know how they can smile like that for Hollywood and hold a smile for 10 minutes, you know. And it's just, we know it's a fake smile. But folks, there's an emptiness in the eyes. It doesn't matter about the lips. Look at the eyes. That's the sight into the inner man. We need to have a passion for people who are not saved. Number two, we need to have, and I'm, I tread now where angels fear to tread, but we need to have an evangelistic pastor. Um, honestly, I, I, have, I, I know a lot of churches where the pastors do not visit, where there's no evangelistic outreach, there's no calling program. Uh, some churches used to have me for meetings. They've, I guess they, I don't know what they've gone into, Reformed theology or other, but they're no longer having evangelistic meetings. Uh, one church out in Montana I've been to several times, they would run about... Oh, maybe 150 people on Sunday morning. And, and the problem there was the pastor wasn't the pastor. The deacons were. And, uh, and they said, well, we're not going to have meetings. They canceled the meetings. We're not going to have meetings anymore because people won't come. Well, you know what, folks? Out of 150 people, usually there would be 40 or 50 of them that would come. And I said to them, are you going to rob those, th those who would come of the blessing? You know, you can take your horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can put a bucket of feed under his nose, but you can't make him eat. You're not responsible for whether they drink or eat, but what, what a pastor is responsible for is making sure the bucket of feed is under their nose and that they've been taken to a place where the water can be consumed. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, uh, Paul is writing there about the ministry. He's not here dealing with the qualifications of the pastor, but the responsibilities of the pastor. And among other things, he says, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Here it is. Do the work of an evangelist. Now understand, he does not tell Timothy to be an evangelist. 
but he's to do the work of an evangelist. I had one book on the life of the evangelist by a well-known author. I won't mention his name. He's with the Lord now and knows better. But uh, in his book, if he mentioned once, he must have mentioned a dozen or more times that the evangelist is more important than the pastor. Did you know that? I'm more important than you are, brother. <laughs> because this, this writer says he wins more souls. Not necessarily. Now, I'll be honest with you, gentlemen. My job as an evangelist is not to, is not to get people saved. That is God's work. My responsibility is to keep my life personally clean and usable and then to proclaim the gospel as simply, as plainly, as powerfully as I know how to do it and leave the results up to God. Now, my ministry, we don't see a lot of people saved. I'll be honest with you. I'll be upfront with you. Partially because most of my ministry is in churches. This is a mega church today for me. Most of the churches we minister in are 25 to 30 people. Uh, recently, uh, in, in March, we had, a, we had a Sunday service at a church where it's a supporting church, too. I don't know how they do it, but we had five people in Sunday morning, including my wife and myself. There's no evangelistic outreach there. And, folks, I know, the, the Bible tells pastors to do the work of an evangelist. In other words, soul winning and evangelism is to be a part of the pastor's ministry. Now, his primary focus is the teaching of the word of God. In Ephesians 4, this other, uh, this other writer says, well, because the evangelist comes first, that proves that God thinks he's more important. And every pastor should use the pastorate as a stepping stone into evangelism. I 100% disagree. God calls men to evangelism. God calls men to pastorates. I never felt the Lord called me to be a pastor. I don't think I have the patience to be a pastor. Uh, what you folks have to put up with. And my pastor loves me because I'm gone 90% of the time. <laughs> I'm a good church member. And by the way, I'm proud to say that Pastor Griffith was my pastor for several years, and, and he was a great pastor. I remember the night, you probably do too, when my parents were involved in that bad accident. And I want to tell you, he was there within 20 minutes, I think, of when he got the phone call and stayed with me throughout the night as we were uh, trying to see my parents admitted that they were both in critical condition, and my dad later died from that accident. But uh, that's a pastor's heart. The evangelist, uh, some pastors say, well, you should never be preaching messages to the church. If you're an evangelist, you should only be preaching to latecomers. Hi, Brother Gary. <laughs> <laughs> this is my good friend, Pastor Gary Myers. He was my good friend, maybe not after this. Anyway, but seriously, they said, you're an evangelist. You should only be preaching to the lost. But what about Ephesians 4? He gave some evangelists and some pastor-teachers for what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. Now, here's the difference in the pastor and the evangelist. The pastor has a major and a minor. His major is teaching. His minor is evangelism. The evangelist likewise has a major and a minor. Our major is evangelism. Our minor is teaching and encouraging the people of God and equipping them so that the people can carry out the work of the ministry. Uh, Acts chapter 28 and, and Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 5, 2 are all passages that bring that out very, very clearly. Number three, then, we must develop a, an evangelistic people. Uh, every church eventually rises and falls on the leadership of the pastor. Uh, and I have noted over the years as I minister, I'm now in my 46th year, uh, that very often over a period of time, it's not going to be when they have a new pastor, it's all of a sudden, but over a period of time, the people are often going to reflect their pastor. They're going to begin to think like him. They're going to be, begin to respond like him. They're going to be, begin to have similar attitudes and, and things like that. And, and that can be a good thing. It can also be a not-so-good thing. Uh, but we need to have an evangelistic people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. And uh, verse uh, 17 uh, through 19. Uh, verse 17, therefore... If any man be in Christ, he should be new, right? He should be different, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. He, he can be a new creature. No, my Bible says he is a new creature. 
I just finished reading a book on the Jesus music. It's a new book published two years ago, but it's a history way back from Larry Norman days. And I'll tell you, it was hard reading. It was, I mean, it was an easy read, but it was hard for me as a preacher and a musician. Uh, the book is full of, talk about poison, brother. The, the, uh, we call them snake eggs. And uh, the, you, you read this book, and they claim, that they claim thousands and thousands of conversions. At one point, there was something like 3,000 baptisms in the Pacific Ocean. But you know what, folks? You look at the people once they have their conversion, once they're back, there's no change. They still have the torn out jeans. They still have the long hair. They still have the rock music. They still have the drugs. And the conclusion of the book, and this writer was part of that, and he's all for it. And then the concluding, he says, the revolution has been won. And it's still rock, but he says, but you have to understand, it's still rock music, and there's still a portion of rebellion in it. That's an honest admission. What song in your hymn book was ever born out of rebellion? We have the great hymns. That, I mean, we, we have hymns that were written by men who were in rebellion, like Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, John Newton said, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And when you're blind and now you see, things are different. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. With these people, it's just you get saved as you add a new dimension to your life. I mean, 1 Corinthians 11 is pretty clear about long hair of men, isn't it? How does this Penrod guy that sings with the Bill Gaither group, uh, he's coming to agree with, how does he justify his hair that's almost down to his waist? Folks, it is completely unscriptural not to speak about their music. That's a whole other issue. All right, verse 17 goes on to say, or rather verse 18 goes on to say, <clears throat> and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, or that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now you all understand. The word reconcile means to bring back into a right relationship with, right? Uh, two people are apart. They need to be reconciled, brought back into fellowship. Man and God were at one time in the Garden of Eden in fellowship, and man broke that and, and, and became separated from God, Isaiah 59, 2. So now God says that the God has reconciled us. God, the offended party, is the one who initiates the reconciliation. It's not us. In fact, we can only respond to God's love. We love him because he first loved us. If God had not extended his love to us, we are not capable of loving him in return. And so God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, not imputing their trespasses. But I want you to notice the end of verse 18 and 19, what God has given to us who have been reconciled. And by the way, who is the us? It's everybody who's been reconciled. In other words, every born-again child of God has been given these two things. Number one, verse, eight, seven, uh, verse 18, the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? The ministry of simply <coughs> sharing with others what God did for us, he'll do for them. But then there are those who say, well, Brother Ken, I don't have the gift of witnessing. Well, neither do I. Nobody does. Check out the gifts. There is no gift of witnessing. Notice in verse 19, he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, years ago, there was a thing kind of getting popularized. I don't hear much about it anymore called lifestyle evangelism, where you just live the life. Hey, listen, folks, there's a lot of moral people. We hear about the, the LBG, whatever that alphabet soup stuff is. Um, we hear a lot about that immoral stuff. Not everybody in America is part of that. That's a small segment but the greasy wheel gets the grease. And they're squeaking, they're making a lot of noise. Folks, I know a lot of good living moral people who are honest, you could do business with them, but they're not saved. A good life, a consistent Christian life is important, but that in itself does not tell why you live the kind of life you live. And so the Bible here says we have been given, uh, committed with the word of reconciliation. The word committed means God has entrusted something valuable to us in the sense that we will care for it as he would. I have a 1767 vintage violin. 
I didn't bring it with me, sorry. And uh, several years ago, uh, it has 28 cracks in it. Estimated time of the damage was back in the 1860s based upon the repair. I had a nine-week mission trip back when I lived in Chester here, and uh, I was out in Asia for nine weeks, and uh, when I came back, found out that our, our humidifier didn't come on on the, on, the, on the heater, and it got too dry, and 26 of the cracks opened up. That meant I had to find a fortune. At the time, there was a gentleman in Swarthmore, you all know where that is, uh, who did a lot of work for the Philadelphia Orchestra, where my former teacher played, and uh, so I called him, took it over, and and I looked at his shop and talked with him about things, and I, I entrusted my beloved violin. Somebody once said to me, if you had to make a choice between your violin and your wife, which would it be? I said, that's not a fair question, because I could always get married again. <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened. <laughs> but I, 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 I entrusted the violin. Folks, I, I had one guy say, Hey, give me your violin. I'll glue it back. It'll never come apart. I say, you touch on my violin, I break your face. <laughs> There's a certain glue they use that's designed so the violin will come apart without splitting the wood. So that violin had to be taken apart, and I mean every piece, piece by piece. I have pictures of this, and uh, the cracks had to be very meticulously opened and carefully, chemically cleaned, and then waited to dry, and then re-glued. And, and I, I know where the cracks are, and I can't see some of them. Tell what's what a good job he did. But see, I entrusted him that he would take care of that, and he would do for that violin what I would do if I could do, but couldn't do because I don't know how to do it. Folks, we're more, the gospel's more valuable than a violin. But I hope you get the idea. That's what God has done. He has entrusted to us the gospel message. And the question we have to come to grips with is, how well are we taking care of that responsibility? And then finally, you never thought you'd hear a finally this early on, did you? <laughs> but this is the, only the fourth point. There may be a final, finally for the first part of the fourth point, and then you know how the finalies go. Turn Acts, to Acts chapter 20, please. Acts chapter 20, and we have here Paul's visit with the Ephesian elders in Miletus. And I want you to notice just a couple of verses here, 20 and 21. We have to have not only an evangelistic passion, not only do we need to have an evangelistic pastor to lead and encourage and set the example, we also need to have an evangelistic people. Now, if your pastor is not evangelistic, and I'm not trying to be critical here, don't let that stop you from, uh, uh, from, from being evangelistic yourself. Maybe you need to go to him and encourage him, say, hey, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we could start an evangelistic soul winning program, go on our visitation, and uh, I'll be the first one to do it. Man, maybe he'll drop over and you have to revive him. I don't know. But encourage him, but that doesn't stop you from doing what God would have you to do. We need to have an evangelistic people, and then we need to have an evangelistic program. We need to have ways that we consider how we're going to do this. How are we going to accomplish this? It's all well and good to say, well, we need to do it. We haven't been doing it, all right? question is, how do we do it? Well, Paul says here in Acts 20, 21, there is, first of all, the public evangelistic program. Uh, you know that I've kept back nothing unto you that was profitable, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. There's the public, and then there's the house to house, the personal. The public ministry is church visitation, evangelistic Bible studies, having special meetings, jail services, nursing homes, any kind of uh, public proclamation of the gospel. And then there's the personal evangelism and from house to house. And I know that to a, to a degree that doesn't seem to work really well in some places today uh, as it used to 50 years ago when I was an assistant pastor in charge of that. I remember, do you all know where Toby Farms is? Uh, I went down, hey, Joe. I went down to Toby Farms one time. Hey, brother. Anyway, uh, you can have a First Baptist Church of Toby Farms and probably have a 1,000 people. But it's a very strong Roman Catholic community. And we used to take our bus down there. I developed a bus route for Bible school. And then we tried to pick the kids up after Bible school to go to Sunday school. And uh, I, I went out there one Sunday morning. There's a whole group of kids standing there. And I, I opened the door, and I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I said who we were. I said, just open the door, let them come on. I said, Bible calling Baptist Church? Oh, no, no, we're for, for Our Lady of Charity. 
because of our ministry at Toby Farms, the Roman Catholic Church started a bus ministry to keep them out of the Baptist Church. So am I, am I responsible for that? I don't know. Anyway, we have to remember that whatever we do, it's the Spirit of God. Now, can we have a couple of guys to pass these out, please? There's a pile of them right here on the, on the thing. Here comes one volunteer, and here comes two volunteers. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. What I'm giving to you uh, is entitled 158 Ways to Evangelize. And it's taken from a book, Basic New Testament Evangelism by F.D. Whitesell, published in 1949. This was when the, in the appendix. And if you have access to that book, it's a, it's a pretty good book. Now, 158 ways to evangelize. Some of these are seemingly strange and outdated. Remember, it was done in 49. For example, one of the things on number 56 is <laughs> skywriting gospel messages by airplane. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of you are old enough, well, I guess some of you are, to remember back in the early 50s, it was not uncommon to have people skywriting messages in the sky. Why not write the gospel? And then in the 57 is dropping evangelistic leaflets from an airplane. Well, we laugh at that, but they used to do drop leaflets over county fairs and things like that. So why not get an airplane? you got to pilot in the church and get a 1,000 or two gospel tracts and fly over and just drop them out. People will pick them up, guarantee you, They're out of curiosity to see what it is. And uh, now, not everything here you're going to be able to use. My idea is that out of 158 ways, surely you can find three or four that you can, hey, I could do that. Hey, this is something we could do as a church. And notice how he does in personal ways. And uh, I don't like the word denominational, but we know what he means by that. Uh, team ways, local church ways. 150 different, eight, 158, I'll get it out, different ways to evangelize. Now, uh, I don't know if you can see this. I want to give you one, one idea here. This is just a sample of some of the things that can be done. Take a look at this sign Tell me, this isn't a good sign. Life has many choices. By the way, it's the same thing on both sides. Uh, eternity has two. What's yours? And if you go to that website, there's a video there, presentation. Also, Pastor Griffith has this thing on there as well. We're trying to get it translated into Spanish and get it, get it orally on Spanish as well. The website, by the way, is translated into Spanish and now Russian as well. It's an outstanding website. There are many materials that are available, including these signs. Uh, I planted about 10 of these along Highway 1 in California. You know the famous bridge, Big Sur, there along the California coast? Uh, on the website, you'll see a picture of one of these signs with that bridge in the background. I don't know if it's still there, but I planted it there. Uh, people put other signs. Why not gospel signs? Uh, these are pretty durable. The, the worst thing might happen is if you have a real windstorm, it might get blown away, but then they're, they're inexpensive enough to buy another one. Uh, they're only $5, and that doesn't even cover the cost of them. I have five of them here with me, but I have more in the car. And, it was a, and a, this all got started with a big billboard on the highway. And then it, it went into these little, these little uh, some of these little uh, witnessing cards. This one's in English. This bigger one here is double-sided. One side is English. The other side is Spanish. Just fold it in half and put it in your wallet and just whip it out and say, here, can I give you one of these? And on the back side, there's a little simple plan of salvation there as well as the website. I have a supply of these down here on the table, and I invite you to come and, and take one or two, as long as they last, I can get more, have more at home. And uh, there's also a prayer card for your eternity choice. Now, these things can be used personally, they can be used as a church. You can actually have your church name in uh, uh, printed right here, uh, either your website, what all can go on there, Steve? Two lines, I think. And uh, if you're interested in that, I, I forget what the cost is, $10, 100 or something like that. Uh, Steve G over here, would you stand up, please, sir? He didn't ask me to do this, but he's the founder of uh, Your Eternity Choice. So don't go through me, go through him if you want to order these things off the website. And I would encourage you to consider it's one excellent tool that you can use. I have one of those in my yard, and everybody in my neighborhood knows about it. Everybody in my neighborhood knows that's the house where the preacher lives. And uh, they'll, they'll probably no doubt... The idea is hopefully they're going to come to you and say, what does that mean? Eternity has two choices. What are those two choices? Well, the website clearly goes into that, but you can also have an opportunity to share the gospel that way with them as well. 
Uh, do you have any questions? I don't have all the answers. The answers I don't have, Pastor Griffith has. <laughs> all right. Um, we have a little bit of time left, don't we? I don't have my watch on. Because <laughs> my time's not gone yet. Can we sing a song? All right, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 91. Now, the, the, uh, the book of Psalms is the Hebrew hymn book, right? We're going to sing Psalm 91 too. Oops, almost broke home. Um, here's what we're going to do. Psalm 91 2 says, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We're going to make a little adjustment. I'm going to talk to the Lord about this, and it's okay with him. I will say, Lord, he is my refuge and fortress. So drop out the word my, and then repeat the phrase, my God. It's like my God, then parentheses, my God, a second time. In him will I trust, and then we'll repeat that last line. It's a very simple tune. I'll play it for you, and then I'll have you finish. Take your life. Not that you care, but we'll do it. <laughs> Send it to you. We will get it for Chad's board back. Amen. Amen. Good. You know, real quick, I, we talked about the Sky Riders, and you're going to go to, we're going to take a break here until our four o'clock session. But, um, you know, a couple of years ago, some of you know that I've been in the technology world here for the last seven or eight years. But a few years ago, a video game company uh, in Singapore sent up hundreds of drones with lights and created a QR code. You know what a QR code is? A QR code with drones and lights in the sky above Singapore and gave away their new video game to the first 1,000 people who scanned the QR code in the sky. Isn't that amazing? There are more cell phones in the country of India than there are people in the United States. What if we put the gospel message attached to a QR code? <laughs> Why not? Above the sky in India, right? So, yeah, sky writing is not too far-fetched, brother. And um, we'll, maybe we'll talk a little more about some of that technology in our evening session tonight. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll be back here at 4 o'clock. Uh, there are two bathrooms. If you head down the hall to your left, both of them are marked as men. <laughs> and there are more bathrooms downstairs, but only one of the ones downstairs is marked as men. Okay, so there's one men's room downstairs. The two bathrooms that are up here are both marked as men, so feel free to use them if you need to. We will start here. Say it. No. Oh, very good. So if you go down the hall past the two men's rooms and turn left, 
Follow your nose. There's coffee and refreshments down there for our break time. We'll start here. You want